I welcome everyone to the 29th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017. And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting. We've had a change of membership to the committee since the last meeting. I warmly welcome George Adam and the returning Richard Lockhead to the committee. Uh, I'd like to pass on my thanks to Colin Beattie and Claire Hawkey for their hard work in this committee. Colin had been on the committee for and its predecessor for several years, and Claire too has made a valuable con contribution to the committee. Item one is an opportunity for George and Richard to declare any interest relevant to the rem remit of this committee. Richard? No relevant interest to declare other than um, please be back. Thank you. It's a good start. Ditto. Uh, George? Ditto. Ditto. Right. That's an even better start. Uh, OK. The next item of business is a decision on whether to take agenda item seven in private. Agreed? Agreed. The committee, the next item, the committee published its report on teacher workforce planning at the end of August. The report included recommendations on the workforce planning, proce workforce planning process teacher training and on different ways to attract and retain teachers both in the classroom and at senior management level in schools. We have received responses to the recommendations, including from the Scottish Government, the GTCS, Education Scotland, the SQA and ADIS. The committee also agreed to consider research on the turnover intentions of teachers alongside these responses, and this is in paper two from SPICE. Before I invite comments from other members on any further action the committee might wish to take, I would like to put on record that I think this committee's work on initial teacher education could lead to real progress in relation to course content. I'd therefore like to reiterate the committee's thanks to the hundreds of people who engage with us on this and other issues raised in the report. In terms of action points to set out in the report, the committee will highlight Education Authority and ADIS response to the government. The committee will also take the responses into account as context for its work on proposed education reforms. I would also like to suggest that we write to the Cabinet Secretary, highlighting the support from the GTCS and Education Scotland for the assessment of the delivery of initial teacher education courses to be undertaken by one organisation, specifically the GTCS or potentially, as is proposed by the Government, a replacement organisation called the Education Workforce Council for Scotland. The Government does not comment in detail on this recommendation, and so I would like to seek further clarification on its position. Do members have any comments on this suggestion, or do members have any other suggested action points arising from the responses? Liz, Daniel. Uh, can I just agree with uh, exactly what you've just said, uh, Convener, because I think it is important that we understand exactly what remit uh, that that new body would have and how that would impact on the existing role that GTCS would play and also uh, uh, potentially Education Scotland. And can I just draw members' attention to the fact I'm a member of the GTCS, but I think it's important that we know exactly where that body would stand. The second thing um, that I think is quite important at the beginning is that I, I think an awful lot of this depends on good data collection. And I'm not yet convinced that we have, uh, or at least maybe it's me, but I don't think I have a very good understanding of how uh, what formula is used when it comes to workforce planning, because there seems to be a bit of conflict in the evidence that we've received between those who have a slightly different approach to the national uh, planning and those, as we heard when we took evidence, who want to have a bit of a local input to that planning. I'm still confused about what uh, methodology is being used, and therefore I think it's quite difficult to set policy unless you're aware of uh, just exactly how the data is um, used. OK, thank you. Daniel? Um, first of all, I'd just like to echo those point, comments about the GTCS. I think I think they're, they're really quite important. I think the GTCS is, is often uh, cited as being an exemplar uh, in terms of uh, its status, um, and I think making sure that we retain its strengths, I, I think, are really important. Um, in, in writing to uh, the government about uh, the ADES uh, uh, response in particular, I just would like to suggest highlighting in particular the comments that ADES make around the teaching of STEM subjects and also the, the, um, the teaching of bi-level and multi-level uh, course contents, because I think this is um, the first time we've seen this in writing. It's something that we've heard anecdotally, and I think it is a, a, a serious issue that needs looked at, and one that I think both the government and I, can I also gently suggest that perhaps the SQA in Education Scotland should also be uh, taking heed on of, and I would certainly like to know what all three uh, of those bodies, Scottish Government, uh, SQA and yeah, Education Scotland, 
I think in response to, to what Ades is saying. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Joanne, I don't sorry. know whether we're intending to go through the response to recommendations, maybe not, but I thought the, there was a lack. I don't think the response matched the seriousness of the report, if I was being honest. I think there's a suggestion that, I mean, it starts off by saying Scotland is unique in that we have over the years developed a very robust model for workshop plan, workforce planning, which didn't feel that it matched the evidence. Now, I don't doubt there's a lot of work done. I think I would be a bit concerned that a lot of there's a, quite a lot of pushback around the recommendations. We're actually doing this, or we don't agree with that. Um, and I think ac across the piece, there was quite a lot of important bits of evidence that came out of our conversations with people who are right in the front line. And I suppose I'm just a bit concerned that there's, that isn't... It feels particular from the government response that we'll, we'll take that into account. There's obvious things that they do take into account, but basically the model's working, and it would seem to me that the model's not working. Um, just simply in level of vacancies. I think this issue about some of the hidden disadvantages that are there around maybe one teacher teaching X number of levels across um, a class, which is unbelievably challenging. And there is one wee bit just on the mentors, where it says, well, of course, there's X amount of money, I think, given to... Um, oh, yes, it's 0 0.1 full-time equivalent um, per predation per probationer as part of the teaching induction. So the implication is that uh, local authorities and schools are funded to support um, new teachers and or probationary teachers through the mentoring process, when what we heard was that was very often not the case. And indeed, when teachers were doing it, they felt it was something extra they were doing. So it may theoretically be that the school has got that allowance, but the, the evidence we got was a suggestion that it was not as good as it could be because... The teachers who were trying to do the mentoring also had other unbelievably full pressures on them. Okay, the, the, a number of issues there. There's a couple of things. One is that the, particularly I suppose for what Joanne just said, the, the government will get the official report of this discussion as well. You know, we can we can add to the letter the issues that were raised by both Daniel and Liz, but also we're going to be having a watching brief on this. You know, over the course of it, so we can always bring up these issues. You know, particularly the likes of what you're saying we've got people in front of us about uh, the practicalities of what's what's happening on the ground and holding them to account. I mean, I don't see... Well, sorry, you were, you were wanting to come back in there, Joanne. I'm just going to say that I'm, I'm not um, sort of being disrespectful to those people who are, who are managing this process in the group. I'm sure that they are, you know, wrestling with all of this and, and so on. I just would be a bit concerned that the implications, we've got a very good system and, yes, it needs to be tweaked. I think we had some stronger concerns in that, and that's with everybody trying their best to make it work. There remain, there remain pr problems, and so I think that um, th these issues around how effective you, you know, the support for probation and, and um, teachers' initial training is is one. But that suggestion that basically the system is OK and we just have to tweak it, I think there's something slightly... This is, the evidence we got suggested there were slightly more problems to it than that, but that's not to say that the people in the front line trying to make it work are not doing their best, as evidenced by all the, the, the extra evidence we got from local authorities and from ADES and so on. OK, but in, in practical terms, moving on from this, I'll be happy that, that we do the combination of we add these concerns to the letter to the Cabinet Secretary and also we, we're going to have the opportunity uh, when we're following up the progress to make sure that's, uh, it's been attended to. OK, thank you. Uh, move on to the, the next item on the agenda, which is the EU reporter work uh, consideration of Paper 3, which is from the committee's EU reporter, Gillian Martin. Uh, the paper discusses the implications of Brexit and Horizon 2020, Horizons 2020 innovation and research funding. Gillian, I understand you'd like to say a few words. Yes, um, so the paper's been brought to the committee in, um, in my role as European reporter. And I wanted to bring an issue to the attention of members relating to European Union's Horizon 2020 programme, which is a flagship programme that funds research and innovation projects in the EU. So between 2007 and 2014, the Scottish organisations have secured 572 million euros in funds. And since January 2014, um, we've been awarded over 110 million euros. And the next date for applications in the programme is December 2017. 
What's, what's of concern to me as the reporter is the comments from the EU Commissioners for Science and Innovation that in the event of a no-deal Brexit, any Scottish university that was successful in December will cease to be eligible to receive EU funding or be required to leave the project. And that clearly brings a great deal of uncertainty and a very important source of research funds. And I'd also like to mention even yesterday in the Economy Committee, we were looking at statistics which showed that the massive economic impact of having a Scottish research fellow involved in these projects. So I hope that fellow members of the committee would agree with me that we need to get more information um, from our university sector on the issue and then perhaps make appropriate representations on a cross-party basis to both governments. So I'm open to advice um, from the committee on what steps they'd like to take and I've set out my thoughts in the paper that you've got today. Thank you very much for the paper, Julian, and uh, I see the recommendations on page three of it. Does anybody have any comments on these recommendations? Anything that Julian said there, Daniel? I'd just like to briefly um, thank Julian Martin for raising <coughs> these issues as, a, as a, a, a constituency MSP with uh, a large part of Edinburgh University in my constituency. These are issues which are of huge importance um, to, to that institution and, and all higher education institutions across Scotland. So just thank you very much. OK. Are we Sorry, do you want? Just um, not to be picky, but I would quite like us just to make the representations as a committee. I, it's very obvious that we're cross-party, but I don't think that's we're doing it as a committee. We've agreed as a committee that that is something we, that we want, and I think, in a sense, that carries more weight than the yep. implications that we're somehow uh, that we're looking yep. at it in a party basis. We're not we're looking at it in our responsibilities as, as a committee. I yep. need to thank you for the report as well. Yeah. Okay. So we're happy to accept the recommendations that Julian has made in page three with that change that Joanne has suggested. Thank you very much for that, Julian. Uh, okay, the next item is we have three statutory instruments to consider today which are listed on the agenda. These all relate to additional support for learning and detail is provided in paper four. Do members have any comments on these instruments? Okay, well in that case, thank you very much. And that brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting. Uh, I will wait for the gallery to clear <laughs> to, before moving on to the next item. Take your time, Lewis. Thank you.